welcome to the 24-hour conference on global organized crime podcast from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. I'm Jack Megan Vickers. The 24-hour conference on global organized crime took place online in November 2020 and was organized by the European Consortium of Political Research Standing Group, the Centre for Information and Research on Organized Crime, the International Association for the Study of Organised Crime and the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. Hundreds of academics, researchers, journalists and others from around the world gathered together to present and discuss the latest research in organised crime. We've selected just 14 of them for this podcast series. But I would encourage you to head over to the website oc24.globalinitiative.net where you can find recordings of other sessions. In this episode, you'll hear the session Gangsterism in South Africa. Hello everyone and welcome to session 13A on Gangsterism in South Africa. Depending on which part of the world you are joining in from, good morning, good afternoon and good evening. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Rukshana Parker, and I will be the moderator for the session on gangsterism in South Africa. I am extremely excited to be a part of the session. Uh, We've had nearly 3,000 registrations to the conference and fabulous participation of around 500 plus people across the four streams in each session. Uh, Another reason why I'm extremely excited to be a part of this session is that we have amazing panelists, all of whom have a wealth of knowledge to share with us today on a topic that is very close to my heart. So without any further ado, let me introduce our panel in the order that they will be speaking, after which I'll speak a bit about how the session will run. First, we will have Rukhshan Lapasco, who will be, who's in the room with me today. Rukhshanda is a community activist and the chairperson of the Manenberg Safety Forum. She will be providing us with a glimpse into the daily life of communities experiencing high levels of gangsterism and gang violence in the Western Cape and in particular Cape Town. Following Rukhshanda, we will have Romani Pinnock. Romani is a management consultant currently working at the Desmond and Leah Tutu Legacy Foundation in Cape Town. She will be speaking to us about the steps towards implementing a strategy. After her, we will have Clara Woltoff. Clara is a consultant working on a variety of social issues relating to migrancy, integration, and crime. She will be shedding light on the representation of gangsterism in the Western Cape policy response to the national anti-gangsterism strategy. After Clara, we will have Aldred Clare. Aldred is a comparative policing and social conflict specialist. I'm going to leave it at there with Aldred's title because he has a long CV with uh, obviously testament to his great expertise, but we're going to leave it at policing and social conflict specialists. Otherwise, I'll be here all day speaking to you about Aldred. Aldred will be looking at the national anti-gang strategy at a more strategic level to determine whether it has missed a step. And then last, but certainly not least, we have Jenny Ayrtoboshiani. Jenny is a researcher at the Global Initiative working on gangs in Gauteng and the political economy of the illicit firearm trade. And For those, uh, what Jenny is going to speak on is the link between the illicit firearm trade and gangsterism in South Africa. 
So from those introductions, I'm sure you can see why I'm really happy to be a part of this session. But before I hand you over to our first speaker, Rukhshanda, I just want to speak a bit about how the session will run. The panelists will speak collectively for about 30 minutes. We will then have approximately 40 minutes for questions and answers. If you do want to ask a question, please can I ask that you use the raise your hand option on Zoom, or alternatively, you could type a question in the chat room. If possible, could I please ask that you switch your camera on when you are asking a question? Depending on the number of questions we receive, we may take a first batch of questions, then allow the panel to respond, after which we can go to do a second round of questions. Thank you. Without much further ado, I hand you over to Rukhshanda Pasco. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Like, like Rukhshanda said, wherever you find yourself in the world and and your certain time frame, I'm greeting you with the most utmost love. Um, I'm Rukhshanda Pesco. I'm an activist against crime and violence in the Western Cape, um, on the Cape Flats where gang violence is rife. At this current moment, our people are experiencing a war on its own within our communities um, of destruction. I think as an activist, what, what motivates me is, is you know, seeing the pain and the, of, of many people, um, lives that has been lost, being a trauma support worker as well, um, living with most of these victims through their pain um, are, are also motivating me to stand up and take a stand against the harsh realities that our people are facing. Um, we have just in Menenberg alone um, was confronted with a, a differently able boy in his sleep in a windy house. Um, he was shot and killed um, while he was sleeping in his head. And his parents didn't even know he died. They thought he went into a seizure just to find that he was shot in his head um, and passed on. And so at this current moment, our, our areas know um, Paramedics can enter the areas without the assistance and support of police. Um, they have, and if they do not come, um, if there's no support, then that is, um, you have to die. Practically, uh, to be straight honest, you have to die then without the support of any um, paramedic assistance on the Cape Flats. That is our reality on a daily basis that we are confronted with. That is besides loving with the fact when, when your child has been murdered by the certain particular person or the gangs, you have to face them daily because why they go to court and immediately they will get a, a, a bail and will be set out again. And the trauma is so deep that, that people and mothers do not care of dying anymore. They want justice for their children. Um, no schooling. I had to warn some people because why the other real and, and harsh factor for us now is that we are sitting with a, a safety and security sector that are not serving its people. It is more applied where you have um, your big businesses, your affluent areas, and you have no boots really in our communities. So where you have um, 10 vans in the CBD of Cape Town or, or 10 policemen, you'll have one in, in an area like Manenberg where it's right. That means no service for our people in our communities. And I do not want to unjustify our police officers working in our communities. They are as human as we are to come into a community where there's shooting happening with a, a, a law and a policy that has been made. You as a policeman will only get paid if you die on duty, not if you are injured. Now, how can I expect that police officer then to give service to me and keep me and my family safe and putting his family 
his livelihood also on the line in serving me. And by mere luck, his family even will get justice for his life or her life that have been lost. And that is our realities daily in our communities. And we have to um, consider each and everybody where they're coming from. And it's not easy. All our mothers do not understand that they've lost. We're sitting with, um, with where parents are still waiting for justice over 20 years for the children that have been lost um, and still they are dying every day on the Cape Plates. They are dying. Now we have moved to another point where gangs are not only just um, do the drug trafficking and guns and prostitution, extortion is being done now in our communities to our local um, shop vendors. So which means, and the fear for us in our communities is the auntie that used to make something to have some income, some form of income with the poverty and COVID-19 that we faced. That auntie is at, is at risk of being extorted by the gang to make business, to make her family merely survive. And the greatest concern for us as people living on the Cape Flats is, will or are our crime intelligence on top of its game in monitoring the situation, looking at the shift that the gangs are taking? Because clearly there's no profiling done about gangs anymore, gang leaders. Um, they have no clear direction of where they are going. And like I said, the application of the manpower is more in areas where there's already resources and none to nothing um, in communities like ours on the Cape Flats where you have, if there's not enough um, human resources, you, uh, our, our police officers, our stations are under-resourced with equipment, vehicles and all of it. So, so um, where does it put us as the people? Beside that we are resilient and, and we take a stand and demanding our right to be served. Um, we keep on losing our children daily. Yesterday, again, three lives lost. And that is every day of our lives. If it is not Menenberg, it's Hanover Park, it's Mitchell's Plain, it's Lavers, it's Belha, it's Pontival. And you can just name it. The names of victims are too much to remember. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Roshanda, for that account. It's a very sad reality that we live in in Cape Town. Um, let me hand you over to Romani. Romani, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Rukshana, and thank you for hosting us today. And Rukshanda, thank you for bringing the realness straight away into this discussion um, about how the children and the families are affected by the ongoing violence, the ongoing systemic issues that are faced by these communities. I, I think that's a great way to bring us back to reality and why we're here today, why this 24-hour conference is significant as well. Compared to the rest of the panel, I'm, I'm not a gang expert. I'm not a community level worker or activist. Um, I'm a management consultant and I was part of the team that assisted in creating the provincial anti-gangsterism strategy in the Western Cape in South Africa. Um, the provincial government here, the department was actually responding to the national anti-gangsterism strategy, which we'll get onto later in this panel. And the scope of work was to develop a local approach to the problems arising from gangsterism in, in this province. And what was clear from the very start and has been clear since the beginning of time with these types of issues is that it's a systemic problem. Um, we're not just here to say, how do we stop the gangs? We're actually here to say, how do we deal with whole community issues? How do we deal with the youth issues? How do we um, create 
resilient, educated, and cared for communities that grow in economic strength. And Rukshana, to your point, that are properly protected by a functional criminal justice system. Um, so, so that was the sort of huge scope of work that um, we had to pull from to to create this this plan for the province. So I'm not going to talk to the solutions that were developed in that strategy because I think a lot of that will come out in what the other speakers are speaking towards. But as the, the person on um, that team of, of bringing it together and facilitation, I thought what would be um, a good addition to this panel would be just to talk about what are the critical steps in a process like this? Um, how um, what what factors are critical during the creation of such a, a strategy? Um, and I've, I've put a, a few thoughts together. The one is inviting the right role players, um, inviting as many critical role players into the room as possible. And in the preamble to this workshop, or to these series of workshops, we really tried to make sure that the critical areas were represented. So that defining problems and designing potential solutions included as many voices as possible of those involved um, or affected by community issues. But the second was to look at the deeper systemic issues. And this meant breaking down our approach into as many of what I call puzzle pieces of the community. And in working with the cohort that we brought together during this process, the group decided to focus on six key areas that they felt directly affected the issues and solutions. And these were policing and criminal justice, peer groups, families, place making and community cohesion, health and youth well-being, and then lastly, education. And we try to make sure that those areas were well represented as well, to my first point of making sure the role players are in the room. Another key focus that we try to hold is that these sort of mega solution building processes have to be top down and bottom up. Yes, provincial government was essentially running this process, but all the parties needed to understand that the political and civil service planning and the action and the planning and action are just as important as what's happening on the ground um, and, and the action often taking place in nonprofit organizations, NGOs, and that we needed to meet in the middle there, that, that top down and bottom up. Uh, Venn diagram, let's say, is critical to finding solutions and that without all the parties represented, heard and involved in the solution building, plans generally struggle to get off the ground effectively. Another key aspect is that buy-in takes time. People have been working on these issues like gangsters for decades and it's so important that a space is created for people in the room who really share a space is created for them to share their knowledge, their plans, their opinion, and that the process, one needs to have patience with a process like this, like the workshops we held, so that everyone is, everyone has the space to speak and everyone comes in willing to listen. The second last critical aspect that, that I thought to speak of is not reinventing the wheel. So much work has been done locally, globally, on youth issues, on gangsterism, on community well-being, and it would be short-sighted to not include this work um, in, in our process. Interestingly, the provincial government, and I'm sure other provincial governments as well, have developed several strategies of this, nat of this nature, and they often, as can be expected, coincide with election years. So there's a lot of good work in those past plans and those good action plans, um, but these strategies are tucked away in drawers, in meeting rooms, in people's heads from a meeting. Um, and, and I think it's, it's very important just to make sure past work gets pulled into these types of processes, which brings me to my last critical step, which is action plans and implementation. So my role stopped at here's the action plan and we weren't part of the implementation. Um, and to, to stop these types of exercises being tick box exercises, it is critical that they have action plans. And I always say, put someone's name to it. Put a department or a group or an individual to an action point, because without assigning those tasks, these strategies lose momentum. And the key to implementation is making sure 
the people with the right levels of, of authority pick up these plans and move forward with them without such a driver or such a champion. They're just as good as the paper that they printed on. Um, so I'll stop there and just sort of framing what, what I think is important in these types of processes. Um, and, and I think the process we ran with the provincial department had some fantastic people involved from all levels, from all areas, um, and, and they were able to really create far-reaching solutions and action plans. And, and if, if I can say where I felt that fell a bit, and maybe this will get spoken of later, is the implementation plan. Um, and Rukshanda, I'm actually going to end with what, what you ended with, is that we, we keep losing. As long as these plans are not implemented effectively, we will keep losing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Romani. One thing that you mentioned at the start, and I think is very important, but is often not said enough, and that is that this is a systemic problem that requires an integrated approach. So thank you very much for that, Romani. Uh, next, we have Clara. Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, I just want to say I'm with you from Denmark. Um, I've grown up here. I've studied and lived in South Africa for five years. And so I'm, I'm not just a person who's... Um, read some document from elsewhere in the world, but it's also why my accent is a bit different. I too partook in, in the process that Romani uh, was referring to, and that's why I wrote my dissertation on it. I would first of all like to thank uh, the organizers for accepting a session on gangsterism, because as you can see, this is a persistent problem. I also want to say that uh, for people like Rukshanda, who lives in areas where these problems exist on a daily basis, we won't be able to do justice to that today and here. But we will be able to talk about some of the things that, that actually are possible to do um, based on this strategy, if it's used. Um, I want to just go back a little bit and just say that my understanding or my contribution um, to academia or to the session is very much <clears throat> founded in history and of course recent history which would be the lingering effects of apartheid, how they remained and rooted even though we had this dawn of democracy promising a new beginning, beginning reform of, of, uh, of the police and I think uh, Don Pinnock captures this very, very well in his description of spatial configuration of cities and legacies of fractured communities in and around Cape Town of course, relating to the Group Areas Act of 1950. In his book, Gangtown, he said, the old city was ripped up. A whole culture began to disintegrate. Although the old working class neighborhoods had been ge geographically bounded by outside forces and penetrated by them, they were places in which people had organized space for their own style of living. And just now we've heard a little bit about what it looks like in these community nows. And, and I just want to emphasize that, that the flats are, are the largest residential area of the city and it accounts for some of the highest murder rates and attempted murder rates in the world. And even though we have seen all of these strategies and, and forthcoming um, policies and, and, and speeches, I guess, um, we still see the problems and, and it's just what the earlier speakers have been, been drawing on to or pointing to as well. So I don't want to really go into this. Um, my engagement with this topic was that I think we know a lot about gangs. We know a lot about gangs in South Africa, but we know less about the impact of, of evidence-based knowledge. And this is increasingly something we're using in preventative approaches to criminality and in policy making. And so my aim was to just firstly look at the potential within this strategy, triangulate it against the locally generated empirical work, and then attempt to just give voice to some of the affected individuals, groups, and communities. In the strategy, as, as Romani pointed to, it's, it's a focus on youth. It's a focus on youth at crisis, at risk of joining gangs, at risk of gang violence and gang activity on a daily basis. And therefore we need this whole of society approach of safe spaces and places 
attention to the family and the education system and to ensure just general health and well-being. And so I think what this strategy critically does is to say that we have what we call a wicked problem with many problem feeders and it's youth that are most vulnerable and most at risk. But at the same time, the strategy is also saying there's not one solution that will solve this. And, and as Romani says, this is not about inventing something new and it might not be impossible to implement, but what we need is that it actually happens. And so as Romani also said, a problem was that once this process of developing this strategy was done, the people who actually was part of devising it had no, nothing, like no lane of opportunity to do anything. We're just waiting, right? And, and for me, this stands in, in stark contrast. Like the lack of, of publicly engaging the people of Cape Town and South Africa in this strategy, using it, is, is just in such great contrast to, to the deployment of military into gang-ridden areas, um, the relaunch of the anti-gang unit, which just like represents this militarized tough on crime approach, which hasn't yielded any long-term solutions. We cannot measure that effect. And so I want to, to really look at this in lieu of evidence from the empirical research, the applicable law and policy, including the national anti-gangsterism strategy, which says that we need to use a holistic approach that includes issues rooted in communities which feed the gang problem. And so my approach did yield something very interesting, which is not to say drafters are bad or someone is bad, but it's really to try and understand how a problem is formulated. What are the assumptions within this definition or these definitions? And what I found was that while we have a, a focus on empowering youth and building community resilience, we actually had more of an implicit attention to the gendered aspect of agency and empowerment. But because local conflict and gang violence does not just impact male youth in these areas and has devastating consequences for women and girls, we must also focus on these things particularly so because the, the research shows us that toxic, toxic masculinity is intractable from gang culture and activity. And this is maybe one of the only things in this strategy that we haven't explicitly uh, addressed. Lastly, I use a lens that's called protected, protected social conflict to just try and understand how the socioeconomic inequalities shaped also by apartheid legislation pose the greatest challenge with regards to youth at risk. And it's what everyone is saying, right? We cannot do this if we don't have basic needs and rights. And so without going too much into the details of what I found in my dissertation, I just looked at some very interesting intersectional aspects that aren't explicitly uh, easy to detect when you read this document because you maybe don't have the academic knowledge to understand the concepts or whatnot. But the three things are social violence, identity and intergroup dynamics and how they, how they play together. The second is gangsterism, women and female youth. And the last one is youth and social inclusion. I'm almost done, I'm so sorry. I, I know I'm going over time here. What I have attempted to argue is not just that there is a discrepancy between what is articulated in policy and what is actually carried out, not just that we need coordination across fields and stakeholder management and synergy across spheres. What I also want to say is that to really effectively do something about this issue, we need to make sure that we transform conflict conditions in the areas with high gang violence, as opposed to looking at how they can fit in to a society that they don't really belong to, a part of society that they don't really belong to. And, and so I wanna just end off by saying that right now, we have more than 35,000 youth at the age under 25 that are not in education, employment or training in Cape Town. They are literally on the streets. 
And so surely when we have a strategy like this, which is set by national legislation and strategy, it should be used because we need to make sure that youth has the best possible means to, to grow up, to educate themselves and with time be this change that we expect to see. So we cannot ignore our duty in doing this. And this Thank you so me. much, Clara. Sorry, I have to keep us it's okay. quick time schedule, otherwise we're going to run over time. Thank you so much, Clara. That was amazing. You've given us a lot to think about. Thank you. I just have one sentence before I just want to say that. So being here, having this conversation, talking about the potential within this strategy is part of pushing for that change. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Clara. Uh, I now hand you over to the one and only Aldred de Klerk. Shana, thank you. And thank you, everybody. And I'm, yeah. Thank you, Lakshanda, Romani, and Clara for setting the scene. What I am really going to just talk about is wrestle us to a national level and say a few words about that. Clara ended about how do we transform spaces and conflict. So I'm going to pick up from a conflict transformation lens and say, yes, the issues are structural, systemic, um, cultural, and institutional. The national gang strategy puts the responsibility for the implementation of the strategy at a local government level. Yet local government is the weakest arm of government. But also a lot of what we're talking about is about street gangs ostensibly. And what we need to understand is that a lot of the street gangs and proxy gangs at a local level are in fact the runners and the worker bees of much more organized entities. These entities will do everything they can to continue to survive, to grow their markets. And in doing so, they will enroll others, they will corrupt others, they will make others, they will compromise others, and they'll undermine the very system structures and institutions that are supposed to care for people. Now, part of what I looked at was the fact that none of these strategies actually has a worldview. It's not saying, it, it, Firstly, it talks about young people, like all you have to do is keep them, educate them, keep them busy, um, keep them in school, give them a job, um, and they will be fine. Well, yes, that is the basic expectation that all of us should have. <laughs> that is, I'm not arguing with that at all. Yet we put them into a system and into a place where that is actually actively seeking to take away their agency, take away their youth. Um, towards the ends of keeping some people's greed going um, and also to continue to, to have them as fodder for criminal markets and the criminal minded. Thank you, Clara, for picking up on the gendered aspect of this. I think that's, that's very important because a lot of the activism and a lot of the energy at a local level come from our women, come from our mothers, come from our sisters, um, and we need to applaud that. I want to continue to talk though about a local government, provincial government, a national government level. And Romani picked up on this, that we do need champions. Not too long ago, we reflected on all the so-called capacity building and development in our national tiers and provincial tiers of government. And what we found is that we have so many more MBAs in our public service. And I actually think that's a problem. We don't need MBAs in our public service. We need public administrators. We don't need directors or chiefs or anywhere. We need worker bees that will go ahead and say, what do I do every day to ensure that the lives of our people are healthy, that they can play, that they can go to work, that they can run around in the streets, and that they can live dignity, a life of dignity and quality. So in reflecting on this session, one of the critical things, and I think all our previous speakers found this, is that people would often say responding to gangs and to crime as an underfunded budget. Well, yes, if you're looking at the coercive measures that a lot of these strategies are skewed towards, they can skew towards law enforcement um, and the rule of law, so to speak. And what they neglect is the fact that South Africa prides itself on being a developmental state. And I think we need both. 
We need the coercive measures for sure. We need a strong criminal justice system. We need integrity in our police force and we need public champions and, and competent public servants and public leadership to lead on these issues. What we also need is a development spend that we can judge on a daily basis to see how it has affected the quality of our people's lives. The lament from everybody as we go, and Roman is right, as we go into a local government election in 2021, whether this be in August, October, next year, or whenever it's going to be, is that people are saying their lives have not fundamentally changed in 25 years. That's an indictment on all of us. Because what then are we spending our budgets on? What is health doing? What is education doing? What is social welfare doing? What is local government doing? So this is about money. It's about budget spend in line with the aspirations and needs of very ordinary citizens who simply want to live a quality life, engage and hug and others and play and travel and enjoy what our beautiful country and region has to offer. Let me end by simply saying that if we do not tackle the transformation of our state and our state institution, if we do not get competent leadership in place, if we don't actually skew our efforts towards the delivery of public services, organized criminal entities who's hell bent on continuing to survive will do everything to undermine our efforts. So when we talk about crime intelligence, in fact, what we're talking about generally in our state security act is a lack of counterintelligence. The understanding, and this is where Romini started off by saying that our analysis is skewed. Our analysis is still wrapped up, I believe, in the activities of street gangs and contact crime, which of course undermines the feeling of being safe and the real safety of people on a daily basis. And that's what, what scares our citizens for sure. If we continue to only keep the analysis that level and do not take the lead of so many of the people on this panel and elsewhere to look at the more broader aspects to this. And now the one feeds into the others. All our efforts will continue to be undermined because these entities are hell-bent on surviving. Thank you, and I'll, we'll take it from there. Thank you so much, Albert. That was great. I now hand you over to Jenny. Yeah, th thanks, Rikshana, and thanks to, to everybody for organizing the conference. I, th I think that while I'm going to be focused on guns and gangs, I think, and it may sound, I think if you are to look at, if you take into account what Aldred said about, about the interests in, in the situation continuing, um, and also the, you need to recognize that some of these issues do need to be dealt with in order to bring in what what Clara and Romani were talking about in terms of developmental issues. But South Africa is the issue of gangs' access to firearms. And going through both the national anti-strategy and the Western Cape response, one of the concerns is that in both documents, are almost completely silent on the issue of firearms and how this impacts on the operation of gangs. And historically, gangs have always had access to firearms, albeit in limited numbers. But what we've begun to see from about the mid 2000s, and, and particularly from about 2004, 2005, is that gang bosses and, and subsequently their members have been able to access significant um, amounts of, of weapons, systematically on how the gangs are operating. The, Research being conducted by the Global Initiative, not only into the Western Cape, but also in Kaoting, has also drawn a direct link between this organized gang, the growth of gangs' involvement in the and the and the diversification of the illicit drug markets. So so profits that are being able to be secured. From, from this illicit drug market have been able to purchase firearms. At the same time, those firearms have then been able to be used to control certain areas of turf. And that relates back to what we were saying about we need to recognize the, the, of what certain organized elements are getting out of these gangs. And 
that that control of the turf has then led to to higher profits. As and and this is quite important for the developmental approach that Rikshana uh, that um, that Rosemary and Clara were talking about. As gangs' access to weapons have have increased, what we're seeing is while gang members or gang members would have in the past had relatively limited access to weapons. Many of those gang members are now able to purchase and buy their own weapons from gang bosses directly. Um, and this is and this has resulted in in a ratcheting up of the violence. And the guns and drugs nexus has become a lethal combination that has to be addressed if we're going to going to deal with the with the influence the organized gangs um, over ordinary gang members. Um, but also the ratcheting up of violence and the link between the firearms is nowhere more clear than in the Western Cape, where you have a situation from about 2009 until 2015, where a certain Colonel Prince Lou from the South African police and certain other members involved the bulk supply of firearms to Western Cape. During the same period that those weapons flooded into the Western Cape, the homicide rate um, for, for the city of Cape Town increased by, by 35%. And the number of murders um, related to firearms almost doubled. What you're also seeing, and this, is, uh, and this relates back to what Aldred was saying also about your, your organized um, crime elements and their vested interests, is that we're in this, in, in, in this process is also that your gang bosses themselves have begun more and more to set themselves up as mid-level black market firearm dealers, selling not only to their own members for profits, but also selling to other organized crime members. And that, that the illicit trade in firearms has then become a very critical critical source of profits for, for many of your gang bosses. Over the last few years, what we've also seen, and I refer to the Prince Louis case, um, but the other, the other examples, We've seen an increasing evidence that the gang's access to firearms has been fueled by certain state actors. And the recent assassination of a senior member of the SAPS anti-gang unit, um, Colonel, Colonel Kinnear, um, at the time of his assassination, he was involved in investigating ma massive guns to gang syndicate. And that together with the arrest recently of more than 15 police officers, including brigadiers in Kaoting, or their involvement in, in, in supplying gang bosses with unlawful licenses um, has brought into sharp focus the, the role that state actors have played in, in fueling the gun crisis. What we're seeing is that while gangs are have, having increasing access to firearms, and this is obviously influencing how they operate, at the same time, the access to firearms and the fact that, gun, gun, um, that gang leaders have set themselves up as as middlemen black market dealers, gangs are beginning to influence the entire illicit firearm trade in South Africa in quite a meaningful way. And, and therefore, I think that if we're going to look at, at, at any anti-gang strategy um, and, we, and, and recognizing the importance of the developmental issues, we need to look at the issue of firearms. How are we going to implement the, 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 the development issues in such a highly armed in, in highly armed communities, and and how do we begin to disarm the, the what have become highly armed gangs? Um, secondly, we need to look at how do we prevent further flows of guns into gang areas, and in particular, how do we rein in and hold accountable state actors who for for the way in which they are they are controlling and managing firearms in the country? And if we and I think that. While this might seem like it's a law enforcement issue, it, it actually also is a developmental issue because it becomes very difficult. And I think anywhere you go in the world, it becomes very difficult to bring in some of the developmental issues that, that Rosemary and Clara were talking about, where you have a society that is as heavily armed as what we're seeing in gang communities. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jenny. That was really well, well done. I will now leave the floor open to our audience to ask any questions. I don't see anything in the chat room. If anybody has a question, could you please pop it in the chat room or raise your hand? I think Rukshanda had raised the hand 
earlier on. Uh, Rukhshanda, do you want to ask your question? <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> um, uh, a lot of what you said make relevance. Um, uh, as you know, I'm, a, I'm an activist, but I'm, I'm monitoring and watching and, and all of it. I want to say thank you to Eldred. Thank you, um, I believe, um, and, and can agree to, with you. I can agree with Romani. Oh, thank you, Clara, for, for highlighting a few issues that I'm very passionate about. Um, but I need to say this. There's going to be no way of solving without the people, like in no way. Um, and the other fundamental thing, we're speaking about human life here. It's like, and it, it, if we speak about holistic, we speak about, um, I'm, I'm tired of the phrase, um, the world, our, our leadership should, should be able to get the world because we as the people confronted with it have to have the world every day just to love and survive through it. And we are saying we're not tired. We are here. We are prepared to take this on with you. The greatest concern for us is, is everything in South Africa at this current moment are being turned into politics. And politics can't drive human life. And the one thing that we are taking a stand against um, although they are planning a local election, it will be an election of the people if there's going to be any election. What about this leadership? If we say our constitution are saying the people shall govern, then the people should govern, and the institutions should support the people to govern themselves and show and lead to what is good for them. For many years, we had it in apartheid, we had it in colonization. We say in 25 years in democracy. Still, we have taken colonization, apartheid, along with us. And then we, we ask our people to forgive, but we forget about the mental pain that cannot just go away overnight. And how are we doing it? Is the environment that are if the toxic of many years are not being changed. We're sitting with, with a whole, um, I, have, I have this Afrikaans word, piranki. It needs to be turned. The plate needs to turn right around and 360 degrees. And the world, even with us as community activists, we have seen the achievements without money without the budget just on the strength of the people and so to us now leadership is making excuses and want to justify the incompetency that they have been thriving on also misleading our people and that is why we say bottom up and the top must support the bottom so that we can lead them and give life to the through words of our constitution saying the people shall govern. The time is overdue. Thank you, my leadership. Thank you so much, Roshanda. I have a question in the chat from Tuesday. I don't know, Tuesday, if you want to switch on your camera and show us all your beautiful face or if you want me to read it out. Tuesday. Um, uh, I have to horrifyingly admit that I actually have been doing this all night. So you're um, definitely seeing the morning after the night before kind of face this morning. My apologies. You look absolutely um, beautiful Tuesday. <laughs> oh, yes. Very funny. Um, well, wonderful panel. Thank you. This was so interesting. And I'm hearing a lot of good feedback on the discussion from various people on all of the million Twitter groups, uh, chat groups that I'm managing today. Um, I, I was really, I mean, we're very interested and committed, as you know, to the issue of community resilience and addressing the gang 
problem of gangs and youth involvement and at-risk youth with all of the sympathy and development approaches that are required to make a long-term difference. One of the challenges I think we see a lot in these conversations, though, is amidst the many youth who get caught up in the maelstrom of gang dynamics are a core of hardcore organized crime who are facilitating drug trafficking, dis drug distribution, arms trafficking, and who are killing people in large numbers. So, you know, and then we're not just talking about reprisal killings, but targeted assassinations, which as, you know, many of you know, the Global Initiative keeps count of. So I, I'm interested to hear the reflections of the panel and firstly, how, how do you reconcile this question and the very emphatic message to want to demilitarize the response in the Cape Flats to also needing to address the fact that you do have a serious problem of organized crime in the classic definition of organized crime. I think that, I actually think that this is what is, is very brilliantly, brilliantly captured in this strategy because it is saying that without solving the problem of drugs, firearms and, and very hardcore violence that, that is a daily threat for many people and, and does account for devastating numbers of, of murders and, and other types of statistics. What this strategy has focused on is saying, how can we have a unit that's centralized that address the legislations, the structures in work in, in tandem with the law enforcement, with the criminal justice system, but then at the same time, make sure that there is a de militarized response on the ground that is just not a one size fits all, but a, how do we actually create the space where, where we can develop agency and empowerment and make sure that, that people in their areas are able to ex exercise their rights as, as active citizens um, and, and get their basic needs and rights on their terms, right? So not just me coming saying like, oh, I look at this and I see this and I see that, but that it's, it's community driven. And so I think rather than saying we in this strategy propose this one thing, we say we need all of these things working at the same time. We need this process to, to work, these processes to work simultaneously, but it, need a coordinate, it needs a coordinated space. Thank you, and thank you, Tuesday, for the question and Clara for the response. I, I think I want to just de debunk this idea that people don't have agency and that people need education and that they need all of this. I think Rukshanda and the many other Rukshandas across the Western Cape and the country is testimony to the fact that people will do what they need to do and take responsibility. They're not passive recip recipients of a service rendered by state institutions, departments, and governments. They want to be active participants in all of this. So that's my first thing. They don't need to be taught. They don't need to be, they don't need a hand up. They don't need their boots, straps pulled up, nothing. They actually just need us to recognize who they are and accept them on their terms. And sometimes they're very unpleasant. They'll shout at you, they'll swear at you. We've got to be present to all of that. So that's the first thing I want to say. The second thing is, Tuesday, for me, there's no tension between having specialist prosecutors, police officers, and crime intelligence who will look at the people who are on the organized, syndicated, transnational component of this. And these will include your researchers, your academics, and others across the world who sit down and particularly look at countering the efforts of those individuals. While at the same time, we need state institutions, to work together with the public sector component who we haven't actually brought into this, local government, commerce and industry, and organized um, society to continue to do the developmental efforts day by day, hour by hour, that improves the quality of people's lives. You need both rather than either or. Um, so this clamoring and politicization of having a gang unit for the sake of having a gang unit rather than having specialist knowledge and understanding with, with com comparable skill and competency, probably capable. And this is where South Africa, for example, is seen to be very vulnerable on the cybercrime aspect. Yeah? 
yet we have real cybercrime capacity which is not brought to bear. Organized crim criminal entities will use technology to, to, to their own ends and continue their own survival and continue their own interest. So we need the specialist while we continue to, to, to make sure that we del deliver essential services with and through our people rather than sit, put them against each other because they're not. They all have to be done. I just want to add, um, I thank you for, for that clarification, Eldred. And so I think if you read this strategy, I think, I think it's pretty clear that what it's saying is that we need a space where people are able to meet. So this idea of finding a space for agency and empowerment, what is meant is actually for structures, for ministries, for departments to go into communities and open up a space to figure out what is actually happening on the ground and what is it that the people wish for the area, for themselves. And so I think that's, that's maybe somewhat what you're also saying, Eldred, that it's not about teaching people what to do with their lives. It's about giving the opportunities, making the opportunities that exist available to them so that they can take them if they want. Thank you so much, Clara. Roshanda has another question. I would say a question and a contribution. Um, I, I can agree with what Aldred is saying very much. I think, I think for me it's important, um, and, and I think we are at the junction now and crossroad. Um, like like Romani has said, um, many studies has been done, many work has been done. And I think it, it is by time that not only taking lead and listening to people what they are doing, uh, what do they want for their lives. We're sitting with the community or a space that was developed, the the Diaw Blakistorp space, temporary relocation area. It's a joke. <laughs> it's really a joke because it's over 10 years and it's still temporary. And you know what transpired last year and what is currently transpiring. And that is why intelligence is, oh, I would agree with what Tuesday to say, I want a special court just for these cases. Because what is happening is we have high flyer gang leaders. It's not only now South African based leaders, they are in a broader spectrum now, organized, totally organized. It's a business, it's, it's, it's sad. Our young people are killing each other and it's being played racially up to each other. A mother has almost been burned to death in front of her children. And so that, that is just for taking a stand, just to look police presence, everybody there, just to see the perpetrators of that tomorrow again in her face. And so for me, it's important that um, Currently, we are running as, 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 as people. I'm, I'm motivating and, and I'm, I'm more than prepared. The only thing that the government can do is lock me up and criminalize me. And that is cool if it's for the people. We're going to take Blucky's door as a pilot, temporary relocation, and we're going to show our government how human beings are treated. How should human beings live? Because the sadness of it all, that small children of the age two, three, and five see murders happening in front of them, rapes, their mothers are being raped in front of them, games are being played in the houses of waste. And when I walked in there, I mean, I'm, I'm in my 40s now, and I opened my mind in an informal settlement. But the exact picture playing off in front of me, bare feet, little children, dirty in COVID-19, no water, no evolution. And we are saying we're living in a country of democracy. It means that we have created a platform for evil to strive and build and constantly break down our people and keep the divide that, that I mean, whether you come from London or wherever, it's a, 
inhumane way of keeping people divided and not in the, even literally with a gun as we see it happening, mentally killing people down. And that is the killing machine, is that mentally a lot of our people have already been killed because you can look at people on the ground in the communities. There is this view in their eyes of no hope. You telling you, why should I go to school when I already know because where I stay, I won't get a job. I won't be accepted at university. And that is our reality. And we must change it no matter what government, we must take a stand. And, and I'm grateful that GI is doing a wonderful thing with this conference. My dream and my vision is let's build a global resistance against the atrocities of our countries being done unto us. Oh, I was just about to say that Rukshanda has raised very key points. And if there's anybody that would like to respond to that or ask a follow-up question, but I see that Aldred, I well, rudely I'm interrupted you. Please go ahead. Anna. I was just going to say that we've got to be careful not to, and we run the risk of doing this. We saw it in El Dorado Park and elsewhere where we criminalize community action and community response. Um, communities take up their own, they, they take up the issues. They don't always do it in a way that we would like them to. And we place the conditionality on that. We say, oh, unless you actually do it in this way, we won't listen to you. Send us your best representatives. Send us your organized entities. No, we've got to be present to all of that. And the people who's most has to be present is actually your local councillors, your local police lead officers, and your local community leadership. But unfortunately, even this idea of community leadership it's erroneous because people lead in their own right and their own way. They don't need representatives to articulate how they feel. We actually just need to create the spaces and be present where they are. You don't have to take them anywhere else. So that's the first thing I want to say. And I think we run the risk in South Africa of criminalizing community action. And we place conditions on it. So that's the first thing. And I think there's a lot to be learned from conflict resolution and conflict transformation, rather than just from policing, especially when it comes to process. And this is where we need to meet each other as people who study this, who look at this, so that we can work more closely together. Second thing I, I, I just want to quickly say is that one of the critical elements that I'm hearing is this idea of healing while we're trying to build community and build society and build spaces. Um, and this speaks to xenophobia, it speaks to um, gender-based violence, it speaks to the exploitation of, of the girl child and children in general. Um, and again, that comes from the idea of conflict rather than policing, but it also is something that requires us to have a different kind of conversation, a conversation that resists away from, from this idea that, that people are just passive. Again, I want to get to the idea that people are passive recipients of state who, 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 who makes resources available. People are surviving with nothing. COVID has shown this. Um, COVID has shown the enter how enterprising and innovative our people can be. And, and, and so I would hope that as we take this conversation forward, the idea of the police being one thing, policing being another, and the strength of our institutions, that those become our focus areas so, so that we don't just put it down as saying, because it's not a failing state, it may be a weak state, um, rather than a failing state. And then we need to look at where we need to build the capability and, capa and, and capacity then of, of states working together with ordinary people to provide a stronger and much more considered response. Thank you very much, Aljit. I have a question from Joyce. Joyce Kamani. Good morning. Um, this has been a very interesting debate. Um, just looking at both sides, I'm Jess Kimani. I'm from GTOC. I represent the Eastern Horn of Africa. And in this conversation, I'm seeing a lot of comparisons between what is happening in Kenya and guns in South Africa, which for me is quite interesting. And uh, 
I've just been wondering about the parallels. In Kenya, we have a lot of kids being drawn into gangs. And we've seen kids as young as six years, eight years being drawn into gangs. And they used, because of the age of criminal responsibility, most of them go scot free. So I wanted to, I'm trying to think, do we have the same problem in South Africa? And do we have a society where kids, kids are growing Kids are growing, seeking revenge, and hence the gang circle continues because they want to revenge either the, the, the punishments their parents got or their friends got into, uh, by other gang members. So they turn and form other mini gangs, and hence the gang problems continues to, the gang problem continues to grow both in Kenya and uh, it continues to expand. So do we have the same scenarios in in your country, or is it uh, a phenomena specific to Kenya only? Thank you. Thank you very much, Joyce, for that question. Anybody on the panel would like to respond to that? I guess I, what I would like to do is maybe do both questions, but together. Um, so, so what is being done? You know, lots of things are being done. Lots of things are working. Rukshanda. <laughs> Is, is an activist in her area. Just as Eldred said, people are out there. People live and persevere these conditions every day, right? Um, and, and so I think the emphasis on, on the coordination, the willingness for government, for institutions and departments to be present in communities is, is a key thing that, that's missing. Sharing knowledge and, and scaling efforts that actually work, being willing to, to put in resources that exist within the Department of Education, or social development, and learn and scale that in other areas. Um, and then, then for gun violence, thank you, Joyce, for, for making that comparison. Yes, like, I am not from a place where I have endured these conditions while growing up. Um, but I can say that even in a place where I live with a great welfare state, these um, root causes, these um, issues around access to weapon, distribution, symbolic violence, all of it exists here as well. And I think um, the manifestation of it might be, be slightly different in each country, in each context, but we do see you know, children that are perpetrators of violence, but they are also victims of violence. And I think one of the, the most beautiful uh, things that were said during the process of developing this strategy was how do you know how to act kindly and, and do things that are kind to others if what you're taught or what you're seeing every day is violence? How will that not affect you? And, and so I, I just wanted to say that, yes, we do see that. And, and the answer to how do, what do we do, we do about it is many things <laughs> at the same time. Things need to be coordinated, but there's no one way of saying, how do we make sure that a five-year-old don't get a gun? How do we make sure that he does not think or she does not think that it's cool? It's, it's a collective change. It's making sure that, as Eldred said, people are healing and it's making sure that there's time for, for reconciliation process of individuals, of groups, of collectives and of whole of society. And, and that, that takes time. And the frustration of not seeing any change in 10 years, I, I cannot even imagine what that must be like with, with the extent of the problem that gangsterism is in South Africa. But, with the amount of violence and trauma that people carry with them in their bodies, in their areas every day, seeing gunshot in a gunshot in your in your school classroom, this will take years. I'm certain it can be done, but it will take time. Thank you so much, Clara. Uh, Rukshanda has a question. Joyce. Joyce, I just want to say, um, like Clara is saying, there's no one way. Um, and we're constantly learning how to go about, but the best is, and that is what I've learned on my journey thus far, the best is to never go in and tell the, our people how things should be done. You, you 
talk with them. You decide with them. And that is how you have successes. Otherwise, you won't have success if they do not um, own the process. So what um, I, I, on, on Monday, I will be unveiling a documentary that I have done with victims in this project. But you know, the journey for me beyond the, the, the victims um, is the fact that while doing and directing the documentary, the layers of pain that is without losing their children, them themselves as individuals, it opened my eyes so widely as to how much work we really still have to do before people will feel human and valued enough again. And unfortunately, we're living in a world where everybody's rushing. Nobody takes a real time out to listen to them, to open that platform and just listen. You don't have to give advice. You don't have to say anything. Just a space for them to echo their emotions, their feelings, what they have went through. And you'll find you'll, you'll build a healthy society where parents would then again take ownership of their two-year-old and five-year-old and protect their child as no matter our people's, um, our forefathers, our parents, the poverty back then that, and, and the pain they also had to live with, but they have protected us in so many ways. In stages, you found out what was your reality. I mean, by the age of 13, I only realized we're living in apartheid. And this is the rules we, 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 we were had to live by and so on. I Only at 13, I started to get an understanding. That is how I was protected. Um, you know, so, so today's child, I can tell you my baby, my, my granddaughter was, was four months when they shot at us. She still cries when she hear bang. A balloon bursting, it's not laughter anymore for that baby girl. She has been awakened by the age of four months by the real reality of what is a gunshot and the trauma that goes with it. So we hardly allow bursting balloons in the house because it triggers my grandchildren in the house. So that is the unraveling and pain layers that needs to be worked at. Thank you very much, Rukshanda. I've just been informed that our time is up. Uh, I'd like to wrap up and say thank you very, very much to our panel for agreeing to speak at the session. Thank you to the technical team for making the sessions possible. And last, but certainly not least to our audience, you are joining in from all over the world at various times. We appreciate it and thank you very much. You were listening to Gangsterism in South Africa. If you'd like to get more information on this topic and the speakers, head over to the conference website, oc24.globalinitiative.net. There you can also find videos of most of the talks, including a number of discussions that are not part of this podcast series. This was the 24-hour conference on Global Organised Crime podcast. I'm Jack Megan Vickers. Thanks for listening.